Welcome to Pharma Drama, the channel where we look at the science of healthcare and healthcare products. In this third part of the DSC series, we're going to look at the effect of heating rate on the peaks we see in the DSC trace, an important factor to consider when designing your own DSC experiments. So, get yourself comfy. I would of course have settled in with my coffee, but I'm in the lab and my risk assessment says that I can't. And let's make a start. We've seen already where the peaks come from in a DSC experiment. But, like many instruments, how you choose to set up an experiment can massively influence the data you record. Think of it a bit like setting up a racing car for a particular track. There are many settings on the car you can change, and each affects how the car will behave on the circuit. Each setting affects all the others, and so the best performance from the car is obtained when you find a group of settings that work to complement each other. Of course, unlike a race car, there's very little that we can vary in a DSC experiment. The instrument requires the starting temperature, the final temperature, and the heating rate in order to run an experiment. And of these, two are pretty much fixed by your sample. So really, the only variable we have to consider is the heating rate. OK, I know there are some things we can do, in particular changing the type of pan as I'll discuss in part six. But in terms of instrument settings, heating rate is really all we have to play with. Having said that though, heating rate has a surprisingly large effect on the data produced and carefully selecting the heating rate to match the transitions in your sample can massively aid interpretation of your data. The heating rate in a DSC experiment is usually linear. It can be modified by a mathematical function, such as a sine wave, which is the basis of temperature modulated DSC, or can be altered in response to a sample, which is the basis of sample controlled DSC. But most of the time we use a linear heating rate. So, how can a linear heating rate be varied? Only by making the rate faster or slower. And why might we consider changing the heating rate? To answer that, let's look at some data. The heating rate used in a typical DSC experiment might be 10 degrees centigrade per minute. If the sample was a pure crystalline material, which only melted during heating, then we would see a peak in the DSC a bit like this. The onset temperature is the melting point, as we have discussed previously, and the area under the curve is the heat of melting, which is termed the enthalpy of fusion. The peak comes from the fact that when the sample melts, it doesn't use the energy being supplied by the DSC to rise in temperature, but rather uses it to break the bonds holding the molecules together in the crystal lattice. If we were to plot a graph showing the sample and reference temperatures as a function of time, and also looked at the difference in power being supplied by the furnaces, we would see something that looks like this, as we discussed in the previous video. While the sample is not doing anything, it will heat at the same rate as the reference. But when it starts to undergo a phase transition, in this case melting, the sample remains at one temperature while the reference continues to heat up. The instrument, which is programmed to heat both sample and reference at the same rate, remember, notices there is now a temperature difference between the sample and reference, and acts to drive the temperature of the sample back to that of the reference by supplying more power. The extra power supplied to the sample is what is plotted on our DSC graph. So far, so familiar. What happens now when we run the same sample in the DSC, but at a faster heating rate, say 100 degrees centigrade per minute? We will get a plot that looks like this. The lines showing the temperatures of the sample and reference are much steeper than with the slower heating rate. That's because in one minute, the sample and reference temperatures have increased by 10 degrees centigrade at the slower heating rate, but 100 degrees centigrade at the faster heating rate. Again, while the sample is not doing anything, it will heat at the same rate as the reference. And as we saw before, when it starts to melt, 
the sample remains at one temperature while the reference continues to heat up. The instrument, programmed to keep both sample and reference at the same temperature of course, notices that there is a temperature difference and acts to drive the temperature of the sample back to that of the reference by supplying more power. But the time it takes for the instrument to check the sample and reference temperatures and notice there is a difference is independent of the heating rate. That is, it takes the same time for the instrument to detect the sample is not at the same temperature as the reference at all heating rates. But in that time, the reference has reached a higher temperature at the faster heating rate than at the slower heating rate. In other words, the sample and reference are more out of equilibrium at the faster heating rate. Since the instrument acts to drive the sample temperature back to that of the reference, it must add more power for a longer time at the faster heating rate, because the gap it is trying to close is bigger. This has the effect of making the peaks in a DSC trace appear taller and broader at faster heating rates. Now, if that all sounds fanciful and you don't believe that in practice we would see this effect, hopefully these data showing the melting of an indium calibration standard recorded with my own DSC will convince you. You can see the data recorded at 10 degrees centigrade per minute and 100 degrees centigrade per minute and very clearly the peak is larger and broader at the higher heating rate. I think you might imagine therefore that you should choose the heating rate for your sample carefully. If you have a sample that undergoes a transition with a small heat change, such that the peak on the DSC is small, then a faster heating rate might be better, because it will make your peak larger. On the other hand, if you have a sample that undergoes several transitions and they overlap, then you might be better with a slower heating rate, since this will narrow the peaks, meaning they overlap less. In other words, faster heating rates are good for maximizing sensitivity and slower heating rates are good for maximizing resolution. The choice of heating rate is therefore a balance between these two factors. You could say to me, why don't I run my sample at different heating rates, one slow and one fast? And I would say, fantastic! <laughs> that is actually a really good idea and I usually suggest running samples at two heating rates, an order of magnitude apart, so say 10 and 100, or 20 and 200 degrees centigrade per minute. This way, you have a high sensitivity set of data, so you should be able to detect all the transitions your sample is undergoing, and a high resolution set of data, in case there are overlapping events. There is, however, an even more important reason for running experiments with at least two heating rates, and that is because it allows us to distinguish between thermodynamic and kinetic events. If you want to know what they are and why they're important, join me in part four. Otherwise, please consider hitting the like button and, even better, subscribing, as it really helps the channel. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you again soon.